us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Indeed. It is so hot outside. <sighs> you're either very thankful of your salvation or maybe you're questioning your salvation right now. <laughs> so it is hot, but God is still good. If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. And as you do that, uh, if you want to follow along, there's several different ways you can do that, whether you're uh, on uh, line joining with us or whether you are here in person. Um, there's several different ways that you can do that. Uh, and you can uh, obviously just listen. If you're oral learning like that, that's great. Uh, you can also uh, use your sermon guide here to fill in the blanks if that's your jam and that's the way you learn and follow along you can do that uh, or you can scan that qr code if you need the U version bible app if you have that app you just and this is iphone i'm not sure on android maybe we'll have an android uh, tutorial one sunday but uh, if you'll open up the U version bible app on your phone or ipad or whatever else you may be using in the bottom right hand corner there are three uh, little bars, just click that and look to the left. You'll see a, a tab that says events. If you'll click that tab that says events, it will bring up uh, a little map, and right at the top of that should be Highland Baptist Church. If you'll click on that, then it will follow along. It's not a video, but it is just notes that you can take notes in your phone or on your uh, digital device. And as we go through the sermon, you'll see areas that we're talking about, and then later. You can look at it uh, for some more study this week, different videos, different further study helps and things like that. Is it now? Is it, am I on now? Not now. How about now? Now? Can you hear me now since we're talking about sex? Is this on? No? It says on, there's a green light, and I've got full batteries, so don't know. One of my sound guys, do I need to switch to a handheld? Can I use the trombone mic? <laughs> Should I do this or should I just stay here? I don't know. What do you want me to do? That's good. This good? Okay. We got this under control, guys. All right. If I put this down in just a second because of whatever reason, I'm just going to go to that, okay? Um, so anyway, you can, uh, you can go to uh, the YouVersion Bible app and follow along with us there. Um, it's not going to take long. I'm just going to switch to the pulpit mic. Um, I just, I like to have my hands. I talk with my hands. Don't y'all? Yeah. Who talks with their hands in here? So those, those of you who don't talk with your hands didn't raise your hand, huh? Because you don't use your hands. It's what we call a social experiment. So Galatians chapter 1, now you've heard the saying, um, I think you've heard the saying, uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Um, and that's true when the person finding the discarded item knows the real value of the item. I think of shows like uh, the American show, American Pickers, or if you want to, if you're more highbrow than that, maybe you go to Antique Road Show, the British show, um, and in the, those shows, they have a couple things in common when it comes to this idea of knowing the value of stuff. First, they have people on the show that has stuff that they don't really know the value of the stuff, which is why they're, they're being uh, offered certain prices or they're coming to them to find out the value. I mean, it may be an old gasoline station sign or some obscure piece of art, but they have something uh, in their uh, possession that they just don't know what the real value is of that item or their items. And the second aspect of those shows is that those shows consist of experts. It would be a pretty boring show if we just saw people's junk, right? And we didn't know what the value of that thing was or those items were. And so the show has experts on it. And these experts, they know the real value of an item or the lack of value of an item. 
and they know how to spot knockoffs. They know how to spot uh, forgeries and fakes. And they know those things because they spent all their time not studying the fakes, but studying the genuine, real deal items. And because they know those items so well, they can spot a forgery a mile off. The same should be true of us when it comes to the gospel. It should be true of us when it comes to the true gospel. Last week, we looked at spotting the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel when it comes to being a matter of life or death. Because eternally speaking, it is. But it's not only just today we're going to see that it's not just a matter of life and death, but knowing the difference makes all the difference for what you trust or who you trust today. So have you ever thought about why you believe or have believed in Christ? Have you ever thought about why have I believed in Jesus? Is it for forgiveness of sins? Is it for salvation? Is it for that we want to go to heaven when we die? And the, 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 the next question out of why we believe that is, where did we receive that information from? Was it from a person? Well, probably, and if it's the, the gospel we're going to talk about today, maybe, you know, they told you the gospel, but it's from the Bible. And so we have to ask the question, why do we believe the gospel found in the Bible? That's a really, really important question you have to ask yourself, because not everybody reads this and believes this. And when we say that the Bible says, if we don't understand who we're talking to, they're going to say, so what? It doesn't really matter because it's not part of my life. And it's not on them, that's on us to know who we're talking to. So why do we believe the gospel contained in God's word? Why do you believe it? Because the most popular practice of salvation in the world is salvation by works. So why not believe that? Everyone else does. Why do you believe the gospel found in this, God's word? Biblical Christianity, it is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. It is Jesus plus nothing else. It is faith apart from works that we are saved. Last week, we looked at the first 10 verses, Paul's salutation, and then the problem statement that there were false teachers coming into the Galatian church just a few months after Paul had planted the church. And now they had come into the church and they were beginning to uh, discredit Paul and they're beginning to move these believers away from the true gospel by promoting and teaching a false gospel. So as we're going to pick up in verse 11, so if you would, you can follow on the screens, follow on your phone, or follow in your copy of God's Word. But I'm going to begin reading in verse 11, and it's a pretty lengthy passage this morning, so just follow along with me as I read God's Word. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles... I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and I remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the others except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. 
Yet because a false brother is secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they, are makes, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. To those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on the, not just the reading, the public reading of your word, although that is being obedient to uh, your commands in scripture that we read your word publicly. But Father, we ask that your spirit would take your truth and magnify the person and work of Jesus in us and among us this morning. That you would call those who are spiritually dead to spiritual life this morning. Lord, that we would highlight that magnificent grace of our God. That we would look at the cross as your greatest work in the history of the world. And that we would come to the cross and come to the realization that we have no place in your presence apart from Jesus. I pray that you would do this work in us. You would unite our hearts to fear your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here is the big idea. That is a lot of scripture that we just read. And we're going to sort of summarize as we go through it. But the big idea, to boil all of that down, what we want to look at and, and investigate this morning is this right here. Is that to know the true gospel, we listen to God and not man. To know the true gospel, we must listen to God and, to not, and not man. And the true gospel is the gospel that is written in God's word. This is where we understand, where we know and learn and are changed by the true gospel. And as we walk through this text this morning, I want to show you why, three reasons why the true gospel is the difference maker in your life, in my life, in this church, in this world, and ultimately in eternity. Three truths, three reasons why the gospel is the difference maker in our lives. Truth number one, the true gospel is the one that was revealed to Jesus' apostles. The true gospel is the one that was revealed to Jesus' apostles. So Paul, in verse 11, he begins his autobiographical section uh, about his life before Jesus how he met Jesus and the change that came out of meeting Jesus. This is Paul's personal testimony, but it's not just like Paul is standing behind a pulpit uh, on a Sunday night in a church in uh, some church in the, the ancient you know, world and giving his testimony. That's not it at all. This is actually crucial to the nature of the gospel, of what you believe about eternal life and what I have placed my trust in or who I have placed my trust in. And so he begins this section uh, talking about the, con or the source of the gospel. Look in verse 11, beginning there with me. He says, For I would have you know, brothers, that, was, that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that was preached by me is not what man's gospel so already he's setting up a dichotomy he's setting up a comparison he's setting up that there is man's gospel in the world and then there's a different gospel there is a false gospel in the world and there is a true gospel in the world verse 12 he says for i did not receive it from any man nor was i taught it implication by anyone but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the crux of Paul's whole argument that he is making throughout the entire book, or this letter to the Galatians. We can read this, and we sort of read it 
in a mirror-like fashion because we don't know exactly what happened or transpired beforehand because Paul doesn't write that for us. So we infer, um, based on what we have, what is actually happening. And so most scholars, most Bible scholars look at this and they say most likely his opponents, one of the arguments that they were bringing to the Galatians of why you don't need to listen to Paul is because Paul got his gospel, his information from the other apostles, from the Jerusalem church. And if, if they could convince the Galatian believers that Paul was somehow sort of a lesser apostle, a lesser preacher, and they were more connected to the apostles because they're in Jerusalem, and they are more connected to the Jerusalem church, therefore, if that's the case, if they could convince them of that, then you would need to listen to us, they would say, more than Paul, because we're more connected than Paul. And so Paul says, no, 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 You're, you misunderstood that. That is not how this happened. I didn't get my gospel from anybody. I got it from God himself, he says. So to argue his point, he says that he was not taught the gospel by anyone, but he received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation is something that was once hidden, has now been made known by God. And so Paul says his argument here is crucial to the nature of the gospel itself, that he didn't need anyone to teach him the gospel. He says, I did not consult with anyone, verse 16, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, the, the headquarter church, verse 17. He didn't have to because Jesus himself revealed the gospel to Paul, and he commissioned Paul to the, apostle, or to the Gentiles. And then we know how that happened because he writes it. Verses 13 through 17, it's one of six New Testament passages that describe Paul's call or his conversion, his call and his commission. And so what we see here in these verses, if you go back and read them, we do not see a man who was given to the things of Christ and who was given to the things of Christianity. He was not favorable. Paul was not what we call low-hanging fruit. He said he was violently trying to destroy the church. He was out for blood. He hated Christians. And he was doing anything he could to take them out. He was the last person in the world that should be preaching a message about God's grace and faith apart from works. Paul didn't need the approval of the other apostles. He didn't need the information of the other apostles. And he did not need the sending agency of the Jerusalem church. He was as much of an apostle, he says, as the original 11 were. Because each one of these men had been personally with Jesus. They had been personally taught by Jesus. God the Father had revealed the Son to each one of these men. And they had been personally sent and commissioned by Jesus with his express authority. That is what makes an apostle. That's why we don't have apostles today. Doesn't mean that we can't be apostolic. And there is a general term that we see in the New Testament for apostle of anyone who is sent as an ambassador. But Paul never uses that term in the book of Galatians. He means one of the original the people who had been with Jesus personally and been sent by Jesus. The gospel that Paul preached had to be the same gospel as the other apostles, but it could not come from the other apostles. It had to come from Jesus himself. And this is what is so inherently important about the gospel. The gospel is not from man. It is God's proclamation that there is a Savior. His name is Jesus, and He saves sinners like you and me. The gospel is a divine proclamation that God is gracious towards sinners. Peter would go on to later in his life to write about this divine origin. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21, he writes, For no prophecy, or knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
So here's what this means for you and me that have believed the gospel, the true gospel, that if the gospel is truly of divine origin, if it is a proclamation from God himself, then every person in here and every person that hears the gospel and every person in this world will have to give an account for which gospel we have believed. The true gospel is not made up by man. It is a proclamation from God himself. So the true gospel is the one that was revealed to the apostles. But the second truth is that the true gospel is the one that other apostles confirmed in each other's lives. The true gospel is the one that was confirmed in the other apostles' lives. So Paul moves in this next section from the source of the gospel to the content of his gospel. And it begins in chapter 2, verse 1. And if you just look there, just those first few words, he says, then after 14 years. There's a lot of time in 14 years. What were you doing 14 years ago? If you're like me, I'm like, I don't even remember yesterday. I can't remember 14 years ago. 14 years is a long time. And it could be he means 14 years after his conversion, or maybe he has a different timeline marker. But what's important here is that it took 14 years for him to actually spend more time in Jerusalem with the leaders, not the church, with the leaders. He says he goes there because of a revelation, and it could be a revelation from Jesus. It could be a revelation that we see in Acts chapter 11, 27 through 30 of the prophet Agabus, that there was a coming famine. And so maybe that was what brought him and he and Barnabas back to Jerusalem. But nevertheless, he took Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the one who stood by Paul when everybody else left. So Paul and Barnabas come back with this Greek guy named Titus, who was uh, Paul's, one of Paul's right-hand men, that he would leave in different places to help establish the church. I'd like to say that Paul was the uh, initiator, Titus was the developer. Man, Titus would go and he would just basically develop what needed to be, that Paul just had not done yet, like put elders in churches and, and organize the churches and things like that. So he brings Titus and Barnabas back to Jerusalem, but he says that he didn't meet with anyone other then Peter, that's Cephas, James, and John. By the way, Peter is considered the missionary of the Jewish church and the missionary to the Jewish people. Uh, James is considered the leader of the Jerusalem church. And then, of course, John, um, he's, uh, we would know him like, kind of like a, in a contextual way, Jesus' best friend, all right? Uh, the one who wrote the gospel, the one who wrote the revelation, uh, that guy. And so, but he does not meet with them publicly, does he? So this is not a staged thing. Paul is not looking for approval from anyone. He's not going back to make sure that he's teaching the right thing. In fact, if you look at verse 2, he says, In order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. I do not believe Paul is talking about here that I wanted to meet with them privately because I wanted to make sure that the gospel that I'm teaching is the same gospel they're teaching. No, he doesn't care if that's the same gospel. Why? Because he's already said he got it from Jesus himself. So it doesn't matter if the other people approve or not. What he's doing, two possibilities is number one, he wants to meet with these men privately to, to, so that he can actually have contact with these guys because it, I believe there is a sort of um, a fear of Paul here that his opponents are coming to undermine his evangelistic work in Galatia or really predominantly among the Gentiles. And he doesn't want to work so separately from them that his opponents can come in and use that against him. Or it could be, and maybe added to that, is that he's concerned that the gospel that he's hearing about in Jerusalem is actually resulting in a, 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 a church that God is not actually building. And that means that the gospel that he could be hearing that's reported from Jerusalem is one that is just a new ethnic Israel instead of the one that he is preaching that is made up of not an ethnicity, but the people of God who are both Jew and Gentile. And so nevertheless, he wants to meet there. And the result of his meeting with these leaders 
is that although he didn't go looking for their approval, when they heard the gospel from Paul, they recognized, hey, that's the same thing that Jesus taught us. They recognize and confirm that Paul's gospel to the Gentiles is the same thing that when we were with Jesus, that's, a, that's what he taught us to do. That's what he gave us to do. That's what he revealed to us as well. And Paul says in verse 7, look there with me. It says, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's Gentiles, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, that's the Jews, for he who had worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the Jews worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the, uncircum the, the circumcised or the Jews. So Paul is just saying, hey, I met with them and they confirmed by hearing the gospel that I preached that it's the same gospel that Jesus had given them. You see, eyewitness testimony and this confirmation matters. I mean, when, if a crime is committed, eyewitness testimony can be crucial, right? I mean, it, it's crucial sometimes to build a successful case and to uh, prosecute the perpetrator or a reporter who's doing a story of a tragedy. Facts are good things, but a reporter, a good reporter doesn't just state the facts. What do they get? They want eyewitness testimony. They want to know from the person who was there what happened? How did it happen? When that happens, they, they, it validates the importance and sometimes the seriousness of the event. It humanizes the event from just facts. Paul writes in this way in another letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what he says when it comes to this eyewitness and this confirmation. Starting in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that same language, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, again, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are all still alive, but some have fallen asleep. That means some have died by the time of this writing. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me, Paul says. See, you can believe and I can believe your neighbor, when they hear the gospel through your lips, can believe that the gospel is true because it is built on eyewitness testimony and confirmed through the lives of the apostles. This is just not hearsay. This is not a story like the telephone game throughout the ages. This is truth because it was spoken from the one who is the truth, the way, and the life. And it was given to his apostles who then can confirm it. And then it was handed down to us. The gospel is a revelation from God the Father through Christ the Son and confirmed by his apostles. Now, I want to bring these two truths to an application point. Because what you believe and why you believe the gospel matters. That's the way we started this morning, right? Is that we need to be able to tell the difference between different gospels. Because remember, knowing the difference makes all the difference. So the true gospel, the last truth point I want you to see is that the true gospel is the one that saves the true gospel is the one that saves. And by saves, if that's a, kind of a foreign word to you or you hear that word just thrown around, what that means is that we are all separated from God who is holy because of our sin. And we have just piled sin upon sin. It's what we call our sin debt. Because we can't, we have this payment of sin that God must pay or punish. His holiness demands it that he must punish sin. And so we all have this sin debt. And there's two ways, two approaches to how we deal with that sin debt, to how we deal with this idea of salvation. And the first way, the first approach is what we call works-based salvation. Works-based salvation. That is a person who is seeking to be saved by their own righteous efforts, Faith in those efforts 
which is inherently faith in themselves, which makes them their own God. Did you follow that? Works-based salvation is when a person is seeking to be saved by their own righteous efforts, faith in those efforts, which is inherently faith in themselves, which means they're their own God, little g. That's the first approach. The second approach is grace-based salvation. Grace-based salvation is that, what well, we've already stated last week and this week, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. And I've put together several comparative statements about these two, and I want you to determine as honestly as you can which is true of you at this moment in your life. It doesn't matter if you've been here every Sunday for the last 70 years or this is your first Sunday ever in a church. Be honest and compare yourself where you are on these comparative statements of these two approaches. Work-based salvation makes for continual work. The list is never done. You never accomplish it. There's never a time in anybody's life that I've ever talked about the gospel with that are applying this approach to their life that they ever have said, hey, I'm there, I'm done. I know that I've done enough. There is no Muslim that will ever tell you that. There is no Mormon that will ever tell you that. There is no Jehovah Witness that will ever tell you that because they don't know when you've done enough. But grace-based salvation offers rest in Jesus' finished work on the cross, that the list is completed because Jesus did it. He did it for you. He did it for me. He paid our sin debt on the cross, and there's nothing else that you have to do and that I have to do to be right with God. Jesus did it. Work-based salvation is a heavy burden to bear. The thing about the work-based approach is that the longer you continue to rely on your righteous efforts, the harder that load is to carry, especially the older you get, because you see the end coming and you don't know, again, if enough is enough. But yet, grace-based salvation, Jesus says, take my yoke on. Let me carry the load. Let me take your sin, and I died for it on the cross. He, he is offering to free you up in that load, to take that sin debt from you. Work-based salvation, because it's based on you, it fuels pride. That when you check one of those things off, when you do one of those things, because that person is their own God, they feel really good about themselves that moment. But yet, grace-based salvation fosters humility because we can't do it. Jesus did. And it fosters humility. Work-based salvation promotes more self-reliance, not less. Whereas grace-based salvation promotes more reliance on Christ and His cross. Work-based salvation produces a continual sin pattern, which we'll get to later in Galatians. But grace-based salvation produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Work-based salvation enslaves a person, but grace-based salvation frees a person. Work-based salvation is prejudice toward outsiders. Everybody has to look, think, and do just like my list. But yet grace-based salvation it's for everyone, no matter what they've done, who they are, where they are in this world, what color they are, what ethnicity they are, what nationality they are, what language they speak, whatever it is, salvation is for everyone. And lastly, work-based salvation is all about me, but grace-based salvation is all about Jesus. Being completely honest, which one did you line up with the most right now? Works or grace? Which one sounds like good news? It isn't works. 
It's grace. That's the good news. So how do you make the change from a works-based approach to a grace-based approach? Well, it's pretty easy. It's what Paul keeps getting at. You place your full trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that what he accomplished on the cross paid for your sin debt and gives you a right standing with God the Father, that Jesus took your punishment himself. The true gospel is the difference maker because it came from God, it is confirmed through his apostles, and it can, be su and it can supernaturally save anyone who will trust in Jesus. Will you let it make a difference in your life today? I pray that you will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that your word is life and it divides those parts of our, the dark recesses of our hearts, Lord, that we like to keep hidden. Your gospel shines light on those areas. And it shows us that we transgress you, we have sinned against you, we have rebelled against the King of Heaven and your laws. But it also reveals to us that there is a King who came from Heaven and He lived a perfect life for us. And He died a sacrificial death on the cross for us. And that today He is alive for us if we will place our faith in Him. Thank you for the power of the gospel. And I pray that you are penetrating our hearts and our minds with the gospel right now. For those who do not know you yet as Lord, I pray that they would come to know you as Lord today. For those who are, do know you as Lord, but they're relying on their own good works to bring about the transformation that you have promised in us. Lord, I pray that they would give up and return to the cross again and return to the gospel and let Jesus do that in us. Lord, would you take our time of response? Would you bring much glory to yourself in our midst as we give you our hearts and our minds as we respond? We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. If there's a decision that you would like to make, I'm going to be down front. Maybe you want to know more about how to have this new life with Jesus that we've been talking about. Maybe you want to use this as your time of prayer, just an altar between you and God. Maybe you've been playing games. Maybe you are saved, but you have just been so far from the gospel for so long that it's hard to differentiate between the two. And you saw yourself maybe on that works-based side, but you know that you're saved, but you know you're living by works. Get right with God today. Come back to the cross. Come back to the Lord Jesus who has given you his grace that is sufficient for all matters of your life. However God is or leading, let us respond in obedience. Let's stand and sing.